Okay, so um, this is part two. Part one, just a quick recap. Uh, part one, I said, what does the uh, Chicago Statement of Biblical Inerrancy really mean by grave consequences? And the answer to that, I to shorten it, the short version is I said, well, let's consult uh, R.C. Sproul's commentary on it. And uh, he uh, suggests a historical argument. Uh, I won't belabor the point too much, because it was videotaped. <laughs> uh, secondly, I um, answer, tried to respond to the objection of, is inerrancy a catalyst for apostasy? In other words, uh, you have fundamentalist kids raised as fundamentalists or staunch evangelicals with a, with a high view of scripture, and maybe they overdose on it, and then they grow up a little bit, and as teenagers, they, wait, wait a minute, I found something in the Bible that my mind can't reconcile. Wow, and I'm a biblical inerrantist, and I think I found an error. I'm going to chuck the whole thing. So that's, that's one um, objection that is sometimes raised, so I responded to that in part one. And this is part two, I'm just giving a recap of part one. Uh, number three, is inerrancy a peripheral matter? You know, does it really matter? It's not really one of the central doctrines, like the atonement of Christ or the divinity of Christ, so does it really matter? Uh, now, now we're up to where I left off in part one. Uh, is paleo inerrancy disqualified by Scottish realism? Kind of a strange sounding one. Most people probably haven't heard this, but this one actually gets recycled every few years. Uh, and I suspect it'll continue to be recycled. So it's good to know about. And after that, um, I'll try to hit the question of interpretation, not inerrancy. I know Dr. Geisler already hit that. What I'm going to try to do is say, uh, have a few things that harmonize with what he said, but hopefully don't, don't really overlap with what he said. And if we have time, I'm going to answer some of the zombie problems of Matthew 27, maybe shed some light on that. Then time for Q&A. All, right. All right, so first question, is paleo inerrancy discredited by its contingency upon outdated Scottish realism? All right, now I'm part Scottish, so I can use this picture. If you're not Scottish, you can't use it. I have the hat to prove it. So. So here's, here's kind of what's being suggested in that idea. So you have a philosopher named Thomas Reed. He was part of the Scottish Enlightenment. He was an empiricist, much like David Hume, only he put a little twist on his empiricism. He added realism to it and actually gave an antidote uh, to the skepticism of David Hume. So because of that, uh, Scottish common sense realism became... Uh, um, popular in certain segments of both Scotland and in the United States. In the United States, uh, especially among the Presbyterians because of their Scottish background. You have the Scottish Calvinists. So, uh, and that's where the Princeton fits in. Princeton was a Presbyterian uh, divinity school uh, to, to begin with. And so we'll talk about the old Princeton versus the new Princeton. The old Princeton, um, supposedly, as this objection goes, absorbed a lot of Thomas Reed's philosophy and or Scottish common sense realism, which I think is at least partially true. I'll, I'll grant that. Now they would say, okay, so that came in through the old Princetonians with Witherspoon, Warfield, Machen, Hodges, and then over time that goes through uh, Presbyterians and also Thomists, which have maybe a different form of realism, not necessarily Scottish, more, more of the uh, Thomas Aquinas kind of realism. Not the Thomas Reed kind. Right, yeah, but, uh, you know, a close cousin, perhaps. So, and then uh, some examples would be uh, Dr. Geiser and Dr. Sproul. Uh, Sproul, of course, being on the Presbyterian side, Dr. Geiser not, but Dr. Uh, Geiser is a, a, a Thomist, so he uh, does subscribe to a form of realism, and I think uh, has some admiration for co uh, Scottish common sense realism. So they would say, all right, this philosophy, um, this uh, root of philosophy uh, bears some theological fruit in the corpus of the ICBI. Now, when this objection, and I know it doesn't sound like an objection yet, I'll, I'll, I'll draw that out. When this objection comes up, they don't really break it down in a logical syllogism. So I, I attempted to do that. Um, for you uh, staunch logicians, don't expect the syllogism to be perfect, but uh, I gave an attempt at it. So here's kind of how the argument goes. 
the old Princetonian bibliology, you know, their philosophy and methodology of what to do with the Bible, we're talking mainly infallibility and errancy and you know, a little hermeneutic, all that into bibliology, uh, from the 1800s to the 1920s was contingent upon Scottish common sense realism. Number two, the philosophy of Scottish realism, sorry for the typo, uh, proved problematic over time. It was, it's outdated, it's debunked, it's, uh, nobody subscribes to that anymore. You know, that, we've gone past that. We've evolved past all that stuff. So, the, therefore, the uh, old Princetonian bibliology is contingent upon an outdated and debunked philosophy. ICBI is also, therefore, contingent upon old Princetonian bibliology and, therefore, debunked philosophy. And now, um, sorry, I know this isn't a, a tight syllogism here, but there's kind of two ways this argument plays out when it's uh, voiced as an objection. And uh, it can go one of two ways, or it can go both ways. One is that, hey, this, this proves that your concept of inerrancy is an innovation in church history. It was just invented by the Princetonians. You know, before the Princetonians, it never really showed up. So that, that's one way that this uh, objection will manifest itself. Uh, yeah, so invented in old Princeton, and then trickles down through guys like Sproul and Geisler into ICBI. Therefore, you should discard it, just because it's an innovation. Uh, alternatively, one way it could be stated is, uh, so that, that, um, that high view of inerrancy that comes out of old Princeton, it's polluted by rationalism. And they, they usually call it rationalism, which is ironic, because it's actually more empiricalism, but these are not philosophers talking. These are people who just dabble the slightest bit in the history of philosophy, but really don't know the philosophy of history at all. History of philosophy, sorry. So they'll say, oh, you know, this, we are going to discount that old Princetonian uh, view of inerrancy because it's been tainted. It's been tainted by philosophy. You know, the Enlightenment crept into it, you know. They're not going to say it like this. This is a little exaggerated on my part, but they might say, you know, this is like the first time in church history that philosophy ever, you know, took over theology. And they're not going to say it that way, but you get where I'm going with that. So it needs to be discarded because it's been tainted. Now, who says this? Uh, quite a few people. Like I said, this uh, argument gets recycled here and there. Uh, Seminese, Ernest Sandin, uh, who's surprisingly influential, he still gets quoted a lot today. Um, I think there's actually some flaws in his uh, view of history, um, which I won't get into. 1979, uh, throughout the, some of the other workshops and plenary sessions, you've heard about Rogers and McKim and their proposal. That was in 79. Also, uh, Donald Lesh, uh, he, he purports the same view, independent of Rogers and McKim. More, free, uh, more recently, Alistair McGrath, actually in 1996. He has his own spin on the same basic thing. Mark Knoll, very influential as a evangelical historian. And fairly recently, Daniel Wallace uh, as well, 2006. Um, and this is just a, a, a minor sampling. I was actually just reading a book uh, two days ago. It was uh, John Hanna's book, Uncommon Union, uh, subtitled... Um, the relationship of Dallas Seminary to Evangelicalism. And he actually, uh, John Hanna, pretty much paints the same picture. Now, he doesn't do it to say inerrancy is bad. What he does is he says, oh, that Scottish common sense rationalism that uh, came through the Presbyterian line, you know, came through uh, Old Princeton, you know, it gets into Westminster Seminary, it gets into, well, he doesn't mention Westminster, he mentions old school Dallas Seminary. It's like Lewis Berry Chafer, he absorbed all that stuff unknowingly, and, and that's bad. He doesn't use it against inerrancy per se, but you, you get variations of this. So it's actually more popular than you might think. Uh, Daniel Wallace, his, his came from a blog called My Take Inerrancy at Bible.org, which is a you know, pretty popular, influential website. All right, so my responses. And there could be many, many responses to this. Here's just a few that come to mind. One is, uh, this, they're wrong. This view of inerrancy definitely predates Scottish realism. And the guy who really 
did a good job of proving that is uh, John Woodbridge in his book, Biblical Authority. This was actually a response to the Rogers and McKim, uh, McKim proposal in 1982. He took it to task. He goes through church history. He's very good at church history and says, look, this is not an innovation. This happened, this view of inerrancy, high bibliology, definitely predates it. All right, now some people argue that, well, yes, the influence was there, but it was negligible. Maybe, maybe not. Personally, I kind of like the idea that it was a substantial influence. You know, not, not that it um, determines everything. But anyway, there are some people who have looked at it and said, no, no, it, it wasn't even, you know, it was there, but it wasn't a big deal at all. Uh, common sense realism, that is. Uh, it's a possible answer. All right, here's an interesting one. Uh, independently of the old Princetonians, the Dutch Calvinists seem to have come up with basically the same bibliology. Now, why is that? Um, to, to me, that, that's a, a proof that there's like a common evolutionary ancestor. Now, I don't think organisms have common evolutionary an ancestors, but I think traditions and certain ideas definitely have common ancestors. I think this is just a proof that the Dutch Calvinists and the Scottish Calvinists are both drawing from an older tradition. I think this helps prove Woodbridge's point. Um, all right, another response is, hey, you know, Maybe realism isn't such a bad idea. Um, whether it's Scottish realism or some other form of realism, more Thomistic kind, or what about this? What if there's a, a Hebrew realism that just underpins the entire Old Testament and New Testament? What, hey, maybe realism is the standard that a lot of people operated on until you get things like Buddhism or uh, Ammonia Sakas coming from India to Greece and introducing some thought into Greek thought, or, you know, until you start doing mushrooms and your mind is messed up or something like that. I don't know. So I, I would say one thing about realism um, is that it seems to be an antidote to skepticism. And some people object to realism, especially uh, Scottish realism, saying, oh, it can't be too. It can't be true. It's too optimistic. It's not skeptical enough. Therefore, I don't like it. It's not true because you know we know we should be skeptical about everything. Uh, to me, that just kind of shows maybe some prejudices. So I'd say, hey, take a look at uh, Scottish realism. Um, I actually had to look up realism. Here's a quote by Norman Geisler. Um, just wanted to focus on this. It uh, frees ministers from skeptical doubt, and he says that's one of the reasons it became popular in Presbyterian churches and or American churches. All right, and I think, I think really an important clarification here is to say, look, the old Princetonians, they didn't invent this. They inherited it, but they took it to a new level. They saw themselves as apologists. They were defending the Bible, especially during the, the fundamentalist modernist controversy. And they, they saw this as extremely important for the health of the church, especially the Presbyterian church in America. So um, as apologists, they were forced by their critics, by their opponents to elaborate, make it more sophisticated, uh, I, th I would say it's probably safe to say they developed it, they did not invent it. Uh, another response is, okay, so let's say you reject realism, just for the sake of argument. It's bad. Let's get rid of it. Let's root it out. Well, what are you left with? One of my critiques here is, those who tend to say that, hey, common sense realism, it's, it underpins your doctrine of inerrancy and it's bad, therefore your doctrine of inerrancy is bad. Okay, well, what are you going to do about it? Uh, they almost seem like they're so ignorant of philosophy that they think you can just, okay, get rid of that philosophy and operate in a neutral, like a philosophically neutral mindset. But you can't do that. There, there's no, you can't operate in a vacuum. You, you will have some philosophy or philosophies that underpin the way you think, you know, your, your epistemology. And it, of course, will affect your hermeneutic and your methodology for understanding the Bible. 
And they, they don't seem to get that. Um, so my question is, if you reject realism, what are you operating on in its place? I don't think they've thought that through very much. Um, here is, um, I think there's a hint here. This is a historian, uh, Bruce Kuklik. Uh, this is published by Yale University, or Yale Press, in 1985. This is from a book called Churchmen and Philosophers, from Jonathan Edwards to John Dewey, the pragmatist. So he traces the history of thought, and uh, especially church thought, and its philosophical roots in uh, New England. And I'm just going to hit some highlights of this. You know, he mentioned Scottish realism in the colleges, so I think that's probably safe to say it was a significant thing. Uh, then you see, okay, 1867, that's where there's a Hegelian journal that kind of kicks in. And then from the late 18th, early 19th centuries, America, Americans ignored German speculation. So they were, they were actively saying, no, we don't want that stuff imported from Germany. And by stuff from Germany, I'm talking about German Enlightenment stuff. I'm talking about Immanuel Kant, Neo-Kantians. I consider Hegel to be a Neo-Kantian of sorts in a more colorful way, I suppose. So, again, an answer to the skeptical empiricism of David Hume in the Scottish Enlightenment. Maybe that's a good thing. Again, Princetonian philosophers and... Anyway, bottom line is, he says it shifted. There was a shift in New, English, uh, New England thinking uh, in the divinity schools and the colleges and you know, pretty much everything academic. Now this is a chart that uh, Dr. Geisler made. I made it years and years ago. I actually first came across it in 1997 and thought, wow, this, suddenly things are making a lot of sense. I don't know if you can see it very well or not, but uh, it, it's kind of chronologically. The, the past is here and, and going forward in time. You've got Aristotle and Plato, you know, empiricism and rationalism. You've got these two streams of thought, and they are totally independent of each other. They're kind of you know, antitheses of each other, and then Kant grabs them both doesn't synthesize them in a Hegelian sense, but he somehow, are, well, the way I would say it is he takes the worst of both. He takes the worst of rationalism and the worst of empiricism, puts it together, and creates kind of a Copernican shift in epistemology that the rest of us have to live with. And this is, uh, you know, this is enlightenment stuff, I and mean, we, we are dealing with this. So you see the colors change. The red kind of turns to a reddish blue. The blue kind of turns into a reddish blue. And you got positivism on one side, idealism here. Here's Kierkegaard, here's Derrida, uh, Husserl, A.J. Ayer, Wittgenstein. Sorry, you can't read them. But one thing I want to point out is, look, there's another stream that comes out of Aristotle. And this is, this is what Geisler wrote, Common Sense Realism, Thomas Reed. Uh, here he puts Thomas Aquinas, and he traces it over to Neotheism. Uh, the, the, oh, sorry, thank you. <laughs> Let me correct myself. Not Neotheism, Neotomism. Big difference. Thank you. <laughs> uh, he mentions uh, Etienne Gilson and uh, Jacques Martin. So, in his scheme of, uh, by the way, this chart comes from uh, Dr. Geiser's book, uh, History of Western Philosophy, Volume 2, at Bastion Books. And he's been using it as lectures for years. So, assuming this chart is accurate, good, helpful, um, you know, we're dealing with the aftermath of neo-Kantian thought. And I would say, look, if you are operating on some kind of realism, and you decide, hey, I don't want to do that anymore, what are you left with? You're going to have something Neo-Kantian, I suspect. Um, and, and to those who propose this objection, I would say, look, again, you can't do theology in a vacuum. You have philosophical roots and theological fruits. So make your choice, but make your choice wisely. Personally, I would much rather go with the, the realism strain 
which is not skeptical. It's actually kind of optimistic that you can know truth. Kant, on the other hand, anything past that, you can't, you can't know anything is kind of the way that goes. All right, so I'm trying to wrap this point up. Um, is it under the influence of outdated Scottish realism? I think probably it's got a little influence, uh, directly or indirectly. It's probably a, a significant influence. Um, and I think, yes, I think the ICBI corpus does inherit a lot of that realism. And I think it's a good thing. <laughs> so. All right, next objection. Interpretation, not inerrancy. This is probably, uh, out of the six objections I'm taking, this is probably the most important one, uh, the most relevant, poignant to today. And here's a list of names. Um, what do all these guys have in common? William Lane Craig, Gary Habermas, Keener, Moon, Moreland, Daniel Wallace, Yamachi, Paul Copan, Seen like a Patton. Well, one thing they all have in common is they all, all but one have PhDs. Um, they're, they are impressive scholars. Definitely want to give them that. Many of them are professors. They are esteemed theologians or apologists. Um, Douglas Moo, his commentary on Romans, one of my favorite books. Um, also, uh, J.P. Moreland. He helped my faith out quite a bit back in 1992 uh, with his book, Scaling the Secular City. I feel like I owe him a debt. Uh, Edwin Yamachi, I owe him a debt. He helped my faith too, especially on the question of, uh, is, the, is, is the story of Jesus just a reincarnation of, of older pagan myths around the Mediterranean, of a dying, rising fertility god? Yamachi helped me immensely with that. I owe him a debt. Uh, Paul Copan, I'm, I, I have... I consider him a friend. Uh, Gary Habermas, I consider him a friend. Uh, and um, anyway, what do these guys have in common? They're orthodox in their beliefs, they're evangelical. Uh, some might question whether they're, some of them are neo evangelical. That, that might be open to debate. Uh, last workshop, the uh, um, Blomberg, is Blomberg mentioned here? Yes, Craig Bomber. Um, the argument could be made that maybe he's not, maybe it's better to call him neo-evangelical than evangelical. I don't want to get too wrapped up in that, though. Admired allies, friends, heroes. Um, and a lot of these guys have made important contributions to uh, apologetics. I, I don't want to take anything away from Blomberg there. I think he's written some really helpful stuff on uh, um showing how the New Testament is reliable. All right, one thing they have in common is they sided against Norm Geisler and company on uh, the, the infamous Lacona controversy over Matthew 27's Raised Saints. And the gist of their objection was, oh, we, we, even though we don't take Lacona's view, we say this is a matter of interpretation not inerrancy. We're not saying the Bible has an error, we're just saying that he has a right to interpret it in a different way. Now, in doing so, as I'm sure you probably heard, ad infinitum, ad infinitum um, in doing so, they are actually siding against the uh, Chicago Statement of Biblical Inerrancy, Article 18, without a doubt, no doubt. This is not, <laughs> not up for debate in my mind. And they also cited against the Chicago Statement of Biblical Hermeneutics, uh, Article 13. Now, so, on, in a way, though, I want to give them, <coughs> give them credit. You know, it, it kind of depends on how you define inerrancy. If you just open up, you know, Merriam-Webster's Dictionary and get a definition of inerrancy there, it, yeah, they're right. It is a matter of interpretation and not inerrancy. But if you want to be in the parameters of the ICBI corpus, well, you, you got... Uh, Two problems. So, now I kind of made up this term, neo-inerrantists, um, as opposed to paleo-inerrantists. Paleo-inerrantists, I, I just made up that term because to me it suggests, hey, this is kind of the original view of inerrancy throughout church history. Go back you know, 
early church fathers, Augustine, Aquinas, reformers, Princeton, ICBI. To me, that's, that's what I call paleo-inerrancy. Um, and then neo-inerrancy. I didn't want to say neo-evangelical because that could be more derogatory than it needs to be. Also, there are some uh, inerrantists who are true inerrantists who agree with ICBI who still throw some challenges at paleo-inerrancy. As strange as that sounds. So, anyway. I don't want to get too hung up on the terms, though. Another thing is, all these guys, because they, they got together, except for Paul and uh, C. Michael Patton, and <coughs> one above that list, they, they got together and signed something, saying, hey, we agree with Lacona's right to do this, to, to have this interpretation. We don't think it violates inerrancy. So, you know, these are some big names and some of my heroes. So they forced me to rethink things. I was like, I, I really need to rethink this. This is serious. And here's, uh, here's what they signed. And there's some, some uh, verbiage that I want to point out. We, the undersigned, just keep that in your mind for a moment. You know, we're aware of what Dr. Lacona said about Matthew 27, uh, blah, 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 apocalyptic terms, apocalyptic symbol. You've heard all that. You know, we don't agree with it necessarily, but we agree that it is compatible with biblical inerrancy. This is what they wrote. I didn't write this. Uh, this is compatible with biblical inerrancy. Despite objections to the contrary, they're talking about Geiser, Moeller, Patterson. Uh, and we're encouraged to see the confluence of biblical scholars, historians, and philosophers in this question. Okay, so take a little mental snapshot of that, because I'm going to show you something else that is kind of the exact same thing on the, the reverse image. Okay, now this comes from... The Chicago Statement on Biblical Hermeneutics. This was uh, uh, basically 30 years before the last slide. This was written 30 years. We kind of think it might have been J.I. Packer who wrote this part. This is kind of like a preamble to the uh, statement. And uh, he's talking about, hey, the work of Summit One, which was on strictly on inerrancy, had hardly been completed when it became evident that there was yet another major task to be tackled. While we recognize that belief in the inerrancy of Scripture is basic to maintaining its authority, the values of that commitment are only as real as one's understanding of the meaning of Scripture. In other words, what you think it means plays into this. Thus, the need for summit two, hermeneutics. For two years, uh, skip that, skip that. Uh, anyway, all that culminated in 1982 with the second summit. We, the undersigned, have participated. To me, I, I look at this slide and this slide, separated by 30 years, and I'm saying this is, this is saying the exact opposite of this. Total exact opposite. Anyone think I'm crazy for thinking that? <laughs> anyway, so I wanted to point that out. All right, now this is, um, a quote from R.C. Sproul, it's uh, from a book called Biblical Interpretation. Um, this basically says, hey, just like you can't separate inspiration and inerrancy, you can't separate inerrancy and interpretation or, or hermeneutic. Um, so that, that's R.C. Sproul's position, which of course fits in perfectly with ICBI and what we just heard before. Fits in perfectly with what Dr. Geisen was saying earlier today. No surprises there. All right. All right, so still on the question of, hey, is it, uh, it's a matter of interpretation, not inerrancy. Well, let's go back. Let's go back in time. Let's go back to the uh, fundamentalist modernist controversy. So Harry Emerson Fosdick, I think he's a very good figurehead for a true liberal. And you can see that uh, he's talking about the Bible and how uh, forms of thought and speech have to be translated into modern categories. I'm getting into interpretation here. I'm definitely talking about the Bible. Now, Harold, this is a Harold Lenzel quote from the Battle of the Bible. Um, and, and I believe he's representing Fosdick correctly here. He says, Fosdick reinterprets what he admits the scriptures clearly teach. He reinterprets it. So what do you want to make of theological liberalism? I think it's, I don't, I don't think it's too controversial to say, look, we're reinterpreting the Bible. We're taking certain liberties. We're saying it's, it's out of date. We're going to strip it of its archaic stuff and modernize it, bring it up to date to the, 
19th or 20th century. <laughs> so, um, yeah, because of his hermeneutical presupposition, blah, blah, blah. You get the idea. Now, is, here's another quote from Fosdick. This is what Fosdick wrote to one of his conservative critics. Again, uh, point of view, matter of interpretation, point of view again, my interpretation of Christianity versus your interpretation of Christianity. So I think here, my, my main response to this objection is you can't escape interpretation, no matter what. It's there, you can't, you can't get around it. They, they are connected, like it or not. Um, here's another one just to drive the point further. Um, this is from uh, uh, Greg C. Singer and his book, A Theological Interpretation of American History, 1975. Uh, he gives a good history of um, the liberal incursion, especially on the, uh, the Calvinists and Presbyterians. Uh, now he talks about the Auburn Affirmation, which this is really interesting because the, um, the Presbyterians had an extra <laughs> layer of protection over their dogma. They had the Westminster Confession, they had the Westminster Catechism, and so the, you know, it's not just, hey, the Bible alone for them. They, you know, well, sorry. They, they are sola scriptura people for sure. But in addition to that, they have another layer of protection to say, look, if you're interpreting the Bible right, you're going to end up agreeing with our confession. Um, so this Auburn Affirmation undoes that. Um, Again, yeah, this was 1924, which I think was a year before the Scopes trial. Um, and it was a protest against the historic interpretation of the scriptures. Interpretation, there's that word again. And they're saying, no, no, we're not, de we're not denying the facts or the doctrines with the Presbyterians have held for a long time. We're not denying those. Yeah, they're, they're necessary. We think they're necessary. But we're, we're just not bound to their interpretation of those doctrines. Uh, and, you know, and doctrines suddenly become interpretations. Um, yeah, and this, this gets me. Whatever theories they may employ to explain them are worthy of all confidence and fellowship. Yeah, it doesn't matter what your theory is. All theories are good. Okay. Um, all right, so apocalyptic genre. This comes up a lot, and this is a matter of interpretation. Uh, fits into uh, some of the hermeneutic discussions. There, there seems to be a, a sense that, hey, if it's apocalyptic, you shouldn't take it literally. That, that's a pretty common attitude. I'm going to get into that a little bit. All right. I didn't have time to perfect this syllogism that's coming up, so forgive me. It is what it is for now. I'll prove it and try to improve it later. So all try to try to see if you can see the any fallacy in this uh, syllogism. All apocalyptic literature is figurative exaggeration and not meant to be taken too literally. Oh, we already see the fallacy already. Uh, minor premise: the Bible contains several apocalyptic genre passages. Therefore, some of the passages shouldn't be taken literally. So, I just want to focus on that. All apocalyptic literature, I don't think, you necessarily, I don't think anybody's going to necessarily say that out loud. I think it's more of just an attitude that seems to permeate a lot of thinking. Um, I think they probably know better than to say it out loud in terms of all. But uh, I think here's an important distinction. We've got the two types of literature here uh, in two different columns. Uh, first, Enoch. Second, Enoch. Uh, Jubilees, Apocalypse of Peter, which is actually a Gnostic um, material. All, all of these things, uh, the War Scroll that comes out of the Dead Sea Scrolls. So you have some apocryphal stuff. Most of it's mostly Jewish. Later, uh, some of it's um, Gnostic. Now, it has apocalyptic stuff in it. So, yeah, if, if I read that and I read something apocalyptic or eschatological, I agree with them. I don't expect that to be taken literally. I, I don't take it literally. I don't expect it to happen, especially as you get into uh, <laughs> Gnostic stuff. At least up here, you know, like Book of Enoch, I'm not recommending the Book of Enoch in any stretch of the imagination. Um, 
But at least with something like the Book of Enoch, something apocryphal that's Jewish, there can still be echoes of previous prophecies. You can have something that Moses said, and, and that may build upon it. doesn't mean it's right. It just means it's... Uh, anyway, I, I don't take this stuff too seriously. But now this stuff, Ezekiel, Daniel, Isaiah, Joel, Zechariah, Matthew 24, the whole, pretty much the whole chapter, Book of Revelation... To me, I, there's a, a white gulf between the two. Uh, and what's the difference? Well, one is breathed by God, and not just breathed by God, I think it's attested to by God. Like, you can go back to some of these prophets and see that these, a lot of these prophecies have already come true. Um, and apocryphal, what do you do with that? I'm not saying that there's absolutely no scholarly value in studying something in the apocryphal, I'm just saying don't. Don't assume that anything about the future uh, is, is going to be true. So, a distinction. A distinction that I'm not sure everybody has. I, th I think some people lump all this together and say, hey, if it talks about the future, eh, hey, whatever. I might be exaggerating a little bit. Okay. Um, another point, I wanted to bring this out, and I, I don't hear many people saying this, so I'm going to go out on a limb on this one. Uh, back to the question of apocalyptic literature being non-literal, why is that? And I think that we actually have, as evangelicals even, we have a heritage where we don't take stuff that's apocalyptic or eschatological, something that is prophetic maybe, and I, I know, you can... You can um, you can split hairs about the definitions of apocalyptic, eschatological prophecy. I know you can talk a lot about differences there. I'm, I'm going to lump them together a little bit here, um, mainly for the sake of making the point that this is actually an ancient tradition in, in Orthodox Christianity. Uh, think about the Alexandrians, who uh, operated on a basically Neoplatonic level uh, before before there was a Christian school of thought there. Uh, you know, there was a Jewish school of thought there that was very Neoplatonic in Alexandria, and I think they influenced the Christian school of thought there quite a bit. And I think over time, the Alexandrian school became the most dominant uh, school of thought uh, within Christianity, um, within early Christianity. And uh, as far as I'm concerned, I think that's one of the reasons, one of many reasons, or what I call, you know, what we call the Dark Ages. I think that helped contribute to it personally. But I won't get into that. Philo, yeah, Jewish, um, not Christian, Jewish, but he was a, a good uh, nexus for bringing in Greek and Platonic thinking into uh, both Hebrew and later Christian thinking. Uh, the Augustinian shift. I think this is. Uh, it's hard to underestimate the importance of this. The Early Augustine, for example, was premillennial. He actually believed, hey, Christ will come back someday in a literal body and create a literal kingdom in a literal Jerusalem with a literal David's throne in Jerusalem. And he believed that for, I don't know how long, but the early Augustine believed that. Uh, but then he gave up on it. Why exactly? Well, who knows? Maybe he just got tired of waiting for Christ to come back. I mean, after all, it's been, you know, 400 years and he hasn't come back yet. So he comes up with this idea, of, well, maybe he did come back. Maybe he did come back in an invisible sense, spiritual sense, uh, and we just can't see it. Um, also, the, but history books really say what, Augustine, what got Augustine was there were some premillennialists who were just all so excited about the coming uh, kingdom and the party that it would be, and, and they were excessive. They said, yeah, we're going to go get drunk in Christ's kingdom or something like that, something very carnal. And Augustine, with his uh, Neoplatonic tendencies, and he used to be a Manichaean with that dualism of um, you know, matter versus spirit dichotomy, uh, he repented of that, but I think it still left a mark on him to some degree. Anyway, at some point, he's just like, I can't handle these guys, these premillennials. They're just too carnal. So, you know, instead of having a carnal, tangible, geopolitical kingdom, I, he shifts to a spiritual kingdom that you can't see, you can't touch. Um, of course, the Reformers, Luther, Calvin, very Augustinian, and, you know, they're, they're doing some important things of re reforming some ideas, but uh, reforming the ideas about the millennium, not, not, not a big deal. 
And of course, millennium is something that we're talking about, a, a future prophetic thing. Um, and I hope I don't ruffle too many feathers here, but I, I would say it's safe to say that those who say that the Christ's coming or Christ's kingdom in the future, if it's if it's just spiritual, I want to consider whether or not you're operating on a somewhat Neoplatonic view. I know it can be more complicated than that, that's fine. But what I really want to say here is this, this tradition that is ancient in, in Christianity can give us an alternate mechanism for why a scholar might say, here's something in the Bible, I think it's apocalyptic, I'm not going to take it literally. You know, I think a lot of people would say, okay, if, if someone like, like Michael Lacona, for instance, or, or Gundry, says, hey, here's Matthew 27, the saints are raised, I don't take that literally, I take it as Midrash or apocalyptic symbol, they might say, oh, well that's proof that he's neo-Orthodox, or he's been influenced by neo-Orthodoxy. Maybe, maybe, maybe not. Um, I'm open to that as a possibility, but I've been looking for it and I don't see that. I don't see him as being influenced by neo-orthodoxy and, and you know, theological existentialism. I could be wrong. I just haven't seen it yet. And so I think, well, what, what other thing could it be? I think, well, maybe it's this. Maybe it's this penchant that, that goes throughout uh, church history. But keep in mind, most of the guys in ICBI, in the, the first two summits, were all millennialists. So I'm not trying to say all millennialism is bad um, or incompatible with, um, with inerrancy. Most of those guys were all millennialists. Um, Geisler was probably one of the few pre-millennialists there. So anyway, food for thought. Never mind that. All right, so here I want to start talking a little bit more about Matthew 27 and the, the raised saints. I, I'm not trying to make anybody a whipping boy here. That's not what I'm trying to do. I just, I truly think that the Matthew 27, the raised saints thing, is just a fascinating case study. And it's fascinating for a few reasons. Uh, one is, you know, Robert Gundry purported one variation of it, Michael Lacona, uh, William Lane Craig. And they're not saying, oh, it has to be this way. You know, Lacona and Craig, they're pretty straightforward to say, look, I'm open to this as a possibility that these things, <laughs> that Matthew didn't intend it to be taken uh, literally and historically. Um, so I think it's a, a good case study because it keeps coming back. Um, Also, many uh, evangelicals and uh, evangelical theological society and evangelical philosophical society, they're very tolerant of the viewpoint, even if they don't hold it itself. All right, just as a reminder, I hope you can see this. Um, this is just a, a quick overview of, of what Matthew 27 says. We're talking three hours of total darkness. The uh, temple veil gets torn. Uh, the earth shakes. Rocks are split. Tombs are opened. Bodies of saints are raised, and uh, similarly, the raised saints leave their tombs after Jesus rose from the dead. Uh, the raised saints appear in Jerusalem, and then one of the centurions either vindicates or worships Jesus. So that, that's kind of a cluster. I include the raising of Lazarus, um, even though it's not in the same uh, unit, because it's kind of on the same level. Uh, it, it's a very similar story, and it actually uh, gets very similar criticism. There are a lot of people who attack the historicity of the raising of Lazarus. So, to me, it's, it's of the same ilk, even though they're not directly connected. Um, so, one thing, the main thing in question, of course, is, uh, you know, the bodies of the saints, were they really raised, and did they appear in Jerusalem? That, that's the main thing that gets questioned by the Gundry Lacona theory, but, hello, sorry about that. Uh, so that, that's the... Uh, let me plug in just in case. So that's the main thing that gets questioned. But uh, if you take them all as a cluster, uh, which I think you have to do, I think you have to take them as a cluster, because there's nothing that really divides them. I mean, it's part of one narrative. And then uh, also, you know, one of the things that uh, is part of Lacona's argument is uh, it seems very 
uh, apocalyptic to him. And when he, does, when he says that, I think he's taking the whole cluster as a whole and saying this whole thing reminds me of some things that I have read in uh, both Virgil and Plutarch. All right, I'll be back in business in a second here. So you can't have it both ways. You can't say, I'm only going to doubt this one piece of the uh, saints being raised, but I'm not going to doubt like the temple curtain being torn. Uh, because if, if your reasoning says it's apocalyptic, and I think that because of similarities between a lot of the events, and a lot of the events in Plutarch and uh, Virgil, that uh, you, you have to be consistent. So, all right, pause for dramatic effect. Try unplugging it, plugging it into your... I, oh, I'm just booting back up, it'll take... Oh, I see. Yeah. I ran out of juice. So are you arguing that Nicona is, is just mud, or, or is that uh, just mud? Like... Good question. Um, hold on, sorry. Not good at multitasking. <laughs> Again, my apologies. Uh, well, at, at this point, at least as far as this slide goes, I'm not trying to argue anything yet. Uh, I just, I said, hey, I really want to take this, I want to take this into consideration. In fact, um, you know, I actually read Virgil's account of Caesar's assassination and Plutarch's account of Caesar's assassination just to compare the two. I was trying to be fair to Lacona and, and see, because I was open to the possibility that, hey, maybe there is a good reason to make an association here. Um, and, and so I was willing to be open to it. So, um, you know, some of the questions you get raised are, you know, why didn't Mark and Luke mention some of the same events? Um, some people, like Michael Bird, say, hey, there is no reference to this stuff in the ancient world. Well, he's wrong. There's a debate between Origen and Celsus that refers to something in the cluster. And then Thallus and Julius Africanus, they ac actually refer to the bodies of the raised saints. Are they quoting Matthew? I don't know. They might be quoting um, or alluding to uh, an independent tradition, independent of Matthew. We, we don't know. But anyway, they refer to it. So... That's one objection taken away. Um, and then Virgil and Plutarch. I, I'm not necessarily trying to agree with Lacona here. I just wanted to have full transparency and say, look, there, there are some similarities. The first similarity is an assassination of a key political figure, Julius Caesar. Okay, you know, king of the world, basically. Uh, he gets assassinated. And then big, big amazing things happen in nature. Uh, same with Jesus, the king of kings. He's assassinated. Uh, so that, that's one similarity. I think that's one of the things that can draw associations between the two accounts. And then, okay, three hours of total darkness versus the sun was less radiant. Oh, in fact, the sun was pale for a year. But it wasn't totally dark. You know, it's kind of up to you. Uh, how closely is that connected? I'm a little underwhelmed there. Um, okay, so the temple veil is torn versus, okay, in pagan temples, uh, Roman temples, you have idols that are weeping. Uh, you have images that are sweating. Unusual stuff. But to a Roman, that would be like bad omen. You know, serious, serious portents of amazing things happening in the universe or whatever. Uh, again, I know that's a little bit of a stretch, but it is what it is. I just wanted to show it. Earth shakes. The entire Alps shake when Caesar dies. Um, the raised saints appear versus some phantoms appear. And there's not even really any uh, explanation about the phantoms in Virgil. Plutarch goes into it more. He just says it was one phantom who appears to Brutus, the uh, guy who assassinated Julius Caesar, who plunged the dagger in first, you might say. So, are there some similarities? Yes, I'll grant there are some similarities. Um, what do you do with that, though? Okay, um, 
All right, switching gears just a little bit, same basic topic, but um, this I thought was interesting because when uh, Michael Lacona went to the uh, Evangelical Philosophical Society to defend his view against the, the terrible attacks of Norm Geisler, um, this is part of, this is really how he started his argument. Um, he, he didn't go to Plutarch and Virgil right away. He said, hey, I'm going to stick with Matthew and Acts. And he's going to say, look, Matthew 29, there is definitely some, call it what you want, eschatological, apocalyptic, future prophecy stuff in Matthew 24. And I think the thing that gets Lacona's attention, in fact, I know it is, um, according to the transcript of the meeting, was uh, the sun will be darkened, the moon will not give its light, the stars will fall from heaven. So that, that to him is apocalyptic symbolism. Um, and, and as it will become clear, I think it also, it's also clear that he's thinking that's probably not really going to happen. It's just, it's just talk. It's rhetoric, essentially. All right, Acts 2. Kind of a similar thing. Uh, this is Peter quoting the prophet Joel. Uh, this is on the day of Pentecost, where you have people saying, hey, what's up with these apostle guys? Are they drunk? And Peter says, no, they're not drunk. It's too early in the morning to get drunk. Uh, here's what's going on. And Peter says, hey, remember what Joel said? That's going on now. Um, there's a connection. Uh, let me be careful. I want to be more cautious. Peter says, hey, remember what Joel said about... Uh, my spirit being poured out on all flesh, people prophesying, signs and wonders in the heavens, the sun will be darkened, the moon turned to blood. Remember Joel saying that? Well, this is what's going on. So think about that. Um, this, this is an interesting argument, because on the day of Pentecost, did the sun go dark? No. Did the moon turn to blood? No. So uh, see, I think to him, and I think to many people, this gives a license to say, look, when you're quoting Joel, you know, it didn't literally happen, and yet it's totally fulfilled. Wasn't this totally fulfilled on the day of Pentecost? I think that's the way he's going with it, which I disagree with, by the way. And based on those two precedents, you can say, well, you know, Matthew 27, there's a chance, it's a real possibility, he would say, that uh, this bit about the raised saints and the earthquake and the tomb splitting and all, it could be. Uh, be open to the possibility that it's an example of apocalyptic symbolism uh, embedded inside historical narrative, because these other two are. I think this is an interesting argument. I think there's, um, I think it was actually very persuasive at EPS. I think Paul Copan, uh, on a YouTube video where Lacona interviews Paul Copan, uh, Copan was very impressed with this argument, I, uh, very much so. Um, I, however, am not. Uh, one of the reasons I'm not is um, in Matthew 24, there is a clear sign in the text that makes it clear that this is apocalyptic. The disciples say to Jesus, hey, when is this going to happen in the future? And what will be the sign of your coming at the end of the age? And uh, so it's, it's very clear. We're talking about the future. It's, it's an indicator. It's a sign saying, hey, we're not talking about what happened in the past. We're talking about what's happened in the future. Uh, also, Acts 2, you're quoting a prophet's prophecy. Uh, so it's obvious uh, what kind of genre you're dealing with there. You're dealing with something prophetic. Uh, but in Matthew 27, there is nothing in the text. Absolutely nothing. There's no key hanging on the door saying, ooh, quick, unlock this lock. There's nothing like that. There's no indicator that says you should shift your hermeneutical gears and say that this is something other than history. Oh, it's a different genre. It's not historical genre. It's apocalyptic, don't take it too seriously genre. Nothing in the text. So that's my first objection. Other things in the text, yes. Matthew 27, no. Um, also, Um, I actually take Matthew 24 seriously, uh, literally, I should say. All right, okay, I'm going to back up a little bit. So, uh, so some precedents. Um, Matthew 24, we already talked about, Acts 2, also Virgil. This, this fits into the same flow of his thinking, Virgil, Plutarch, similar things. Uh, Midrash, Mishnah. Uh, there's some things there that are apocalyptic, and we shouldn't take them too literally. We should take them with a grain of salt, uh, because they're not inspired. Uh, 
Therefore, be open to the possibility that Matthew 27 could be something you shouldn't take, um, literally. I'm not trying to say his argument's right. I'm just trying to take pains to do some justice, to say it's an interesting argument. It's not a stupid argument by any means, uh, but it's an argument I think we should deconstruct and consider. So here's my judgments on all those. All right, Matthew 24. Well, if you're a preterist, or especially a preterist, not so much a semi-preterist, then, uh, yeah, you, you might say that you shouldn't take it too literally. In fact, I think it's fair to say most don't take most of Matthew 24 too literally. But if you're a futurist, or a premillennialist, you probably take this very literally. So, all right, uh, this one I like, the Peter's quotation of Joel in Acts 2. My problem with that is there are at least three other explanations uh, for for uh, understanding what Peter's saying about Joel's prophecy, at least three. And I happen to like all three of them better than uh, Lacona's view. And I'll say a little more about that later. Um, yes, there are some similarities between Caesar's death and the accounts of amazing, crazy things that happened there and Jesus' death. And yes, I would agree. Yeah, we don't want to take Plutarch or Virgil too seriously. Like, yeah. Did, Oh, there's some crazy stuff in there. Yeah, it didn't happen literally. So I'll grant that. But, you know, how closely are they connected? How much correspondence is there between the, the Caesar and Jesus accounts? Um, just me personally, uh, I don't see much similarity. I'm, I'm underwhelmed. Uh, let's get that. Um, could be, I'm just dubious. You know I'm dubious about that. All right, so uh, back to the point about um, explaining Peter's quotation of Joel. Here, here's what I mentioned about three possibilities, uh, and there, there may be more, but uh, this is by uh, J. Dwight Pentecost in his book, uh, 2010 book, New Wine, A Study of Transition in the Book of Acts. And uh, he mentions three different views. First one says, hey, this, what's going on here at Pentecost is similar to what Joel was talking about. It's not necessarily the exact same thing, but hey, if, if you're expecting Joel's prophecy to be literally fulfilled, this shouldn't surprise you too much. Uh, second view, maybe it's a double reference with a near and far view. Like uh, maybe Joel's prophecy can be fulfilled in the near in one way and also fulfilled in a greater way in the future. I like that idea. Um, I like the first idea a little better, personally. Uh, third view, I'm going to skip the third view. All right. Um, hope I'm not uh, beating a dead horse here, but uh, I was just really interested in the Virgil and Plutarch stuff. So here are some of the other things that Virgil was talking about. Uh, he also said animals spoke with human language. There were ominous, scary omens in the behavior of dogs, wolves, and birds, all after the assassination of uh, Julius Caesar. Uh, when you cut open an animal to look at its entrails to try to predict the future, oh, there were ominous omens in the entrails. Uh, you have intense lightning, but there are no clouds. Ooh. Okay. Uh, alarming glare from a comet, which was seen for seven days. Uh, the volcano Etna erupted. Most rivers stood still while the river Po overflowed big time, washing away like everything in its path. So. Should we take that literally? No. Um, the real question is, does it remind you of the Bible? And you know what? Even if it did remind you of the Bible, that doesn't, even that, even if, even if I could concede that point, it doesn't mean that uh, what follows in Kona's argument is true. Um, it could, you know, let, let's just say for the sake of argument, let's just pretend, for me it's pretending, that these are connected. Like you could look at it as a literary critic and say, yeah, I see a one-for-one -one correspondence, major correspondence between these. I do think Matthew was emulating Virgil, Plutarch, etc. Let's just pretend that's true. So what? Uh, as an apologist, I could say, well, you know, Matthew, assuming he was familiar with those writings, uh, or maybe this was in the wisdom of the Holy Spirit who told him to write this way, hey, write this way. Um, to get people's attention and, you know, to shake them up a little bit, um, to mess with their minds a little bit. Because if the, if the pagans, and I don't even think Matthew really wrote to the pagans, I think he wrote to the Jews who didn't speak Greek at all, really. Um, you know, if people are familiar with this and you kind of mimic the sound of it, you're going to hit certain synapses in their head. You're going to make them do some serious thinking. 
Um, but it doesn't mean you shouldn't take it literally, uh, non-literally. How are we doing on time? Ah, so we're going over. <laughs> All right, should uh, tell you what. Okay, well, I wanted to give you this. Here's my email address. In case you wanted some of the quotes uh, that I had here or whatever, feel free to, to hit me up that way. And uh, one last one last thought. That's from Isaiah. Isaiah. Uh, <coughs> God speaking here. Um, this is the one to whom I will look. Uh, he who is humble and contrite in spirit and trembles at my word. Um, I just want to emphasize, look, dealing with the Bible, it's, it's not a game. I, I think some scholars maybe think of it like a sport. Like, hey, this is an exciting sport. What can I do with this? What, what can I be, you know, I want to make a name for myself. I want to be innovative. I'm not naming names. I'm not saying, I'm not trying to single anybody out. I just think this is uh, normal for humans to do, uh, even biblical scholars. And I uh, just want to say, hey, let's go back to this. Do you, do you tremble at his word or not? All right. All right. Uh, feel free to what ten minutes until dinner, or if you want to ask questions, feel free to do that too. Or queries. Thanks for taking that, Scott. Yeah. And thank you all for coming. Yeah.